What's up, everyone? John, um, actually, Matthew uh, uh, 3, 16 through 17. These are manifestations of the one God. Let's see it. All right. I'm going to show you a few things. <clears throat> because there seems to be some who are confused about this because they see three of something. And so um, automatically forget that God is omnipresent and link the three of something as three of persons in the Godhead. And I'm going to disprove that. Watch this. Matthew uh, 3, verse 16. Now, I, I, I speak this in love, but if you've been taught wrong, then you should come under agreement with the word and believe what the word says and not what um, religion has taught you in traditions and doctrines of men but what the Bible actually teaches and believe that. It's important that you understand God is one. That's the very first and greatest commandment that was given to us, to understand that God is one, one Lord. Now, <clears throat> let's read it. Um, Matthew 3, verse 16. Then he was baptized. Then when he was baptized, John came, um, Jesus came up immediately. Um, John's the one that baptized him. Jesus came up immediately from the water. <clears throat> and behold, the heavens were, were open to him, to Jesus, um, to John, I mean, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, he, John. So the heavens were open to John, and John saw. Uh, this would be John the Baptist. John the Baptist saw the Spirit of God descending upon Jesus and alightening upon him like a dove. Verse 17, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Okay, now, because they see Jesus being baptized and they see um, the spirit of God descending upon him like a dove and then they hear the father speaking from heaven, they automatically who lack understanding of God's omnipresence said, there it is right there, Trinity. That's three persons. No, it's not. It's manifestations. Now, let me prove it. One, um, well, actually, let me just go to the scripture and prove it. Look at John. One and thirty two. Let's go there. And all of you are getting, get understanding. Never infer something into scripture. Never say what the Bible does not say. If you don't see three persons or three personalities or anything in, in the Bible that says that, then you shouldn't believe that. Otherwise, you make it up. All right. John 1, verse 32. And John bore witness. This is speaking about the same situation. It's just a different account, John's account of it. 
the Apostle John, giving an account of what the what John the Baptist experienced. <clears throat> and John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descend, descending um, from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. Okay, so the Spirit of God descended upon the Son of God and remained upon him. Look at verse 33. I did not know him, did not know who, did not know the Son of God or who was the Son of God. I did not know him. So he could not have pre-existed as a son. John said, I did not know him. I did not know him. But he who sent me, that would be the father who sent John, he who sent me to baptize with water, said to me, so the father said to John, the uh, Baptist, upon whom you see the spirit descending. And remaining upon him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Who's the Son of God? The Son of God was the one who the Spirit descended upon. Not the Spirit that descended upon him. The Son of God was who the Spirit descended upon. And that was a sign to John. So what did the Spirit descend upon? The Spirit descended upon a man. So the man was the Son of God, not the Spirit that descended upon the man. So the Son of God consisted of flesh and blood. All right. Now, let's look at some more detail of who the spirit is. Because right there, because you see the spirit descend upon him and then you hear the father speak from heaven. Suddenly you forget about the omnipresence of God and you say, oh, that's two of them. No, it's not. Let me show you. Let me show you. Okay, so does everyone see that the reason why the heavens were open to John when he baptized Jesus was so that he could receive the sign that was given to him from the Father that who you see the Spirit descend upon, that's the one. That is the Son of God, and that is he who baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Now, um... Interesting because the father is the one that baptizes <laughs> with the Holy Ghost. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit. <laughs> and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. The father is the one that baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Joel 2.28. So that Jesus, the one who the spirit descended upon, that's the son what he did, what the spirit descended upon is the son. But that spirit that descended upon him, he's also that spirit. Now, let me prove it to you. Let me prove it to you. And then let me prove to you who that spirit is. <laughs> Watch this. Watch this. Okay. So, um, Let's go to John 14. Um, John 14. In verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, that's Jesus speaking. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. 
but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Now, where does the Father dwell? The Father dwell in him. In, in who? The Son. And who was doing the works? Not a son. The Father that dwells in him was doing the works. So the spirit that dwell in him was not a God, the son, or any other type of God. The spirit that dwell in him was the father only. And the only one who was doing works through him was the father. But wait a minute. The Holy Spirit's the one that descended upon him, right? Now, watch this. Watch this. So he said the father is the one that dwells in him. Watch where else he said the father is. Look at Matthew. Keep that in mind. The father was in him doing works. Keep that in mind. <clears throat> and let's take a look at Matthew. 23. And verse 9, look at this. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. So wait a minute, right here he says the father's in heaven. But we found in John fourteen ten, the father is in him. Doing what? Doing the works. And that the Son of God could not do the works himself. So all the miracles and all the great things that you saw the Son of God do, that was the Father doing it through him. He didn't do it on his own, which means that he's not in the Godhead. Because if the Son was God... Or functioning as God and not as man, then he would need the Father to do nothing. He would be able to do it on his own. But no, he said, it is the Father that dwells in him who does the works. He told you. Do you believe him? Or do you have something else made up for him that he did not say? His statement was, I can't do anything of myself. His statement was, it is the Father that does the works. So all the glory goes to the Father. That's the God. That's the God. That's the God of the Son. And that's the only God of the Son. Now, look at this. Look at this. Let's look at some more. Let's look at some more. This is just the beginning. Okay, so you see the fathers in both places at the same time in operation. He spoke from heaven. That's him. But he was also in the sun doing the works. That's him. That's where omnipresence is everywhere. Now, look at John uh, 16. John, the Gospel John, and let's look at chapter 16, and uh, verse 32, the Gospel John, uh, chapter 16, verse 32, indeed, the hour is coming, Yes, has now come that you will be scattered, each to his own, and you will leave me alone. Okay, Jesus said you will leave me alone. But watch what he says. And yet I am not alone because, or in other words, for this reason, this is why I'm not alone. I'm not alone because the Father is with me. Now, who did he say was with him? That's who you need to say is with him. 
the Father is with him. Did he say God the Son was with him or mention some other spirit that's hovering over the earth like the Father? No. He said the Father is with him. And that's the reason he's not alone. Now, if the Father separated from him, he'd be alone. Otherwise, if he was not alone, then there would be another person there after the Father leaves. But no, he said, he's not alone because the Father is with him. And he doesn't mention anybody else. So, the Holy Spirit that was with him is that Father. This is a problem for Trinity doctrine because they believe the Holy Spirit is somebody else in the Godhead. A third person, actually. Bible doesn't teach that nowhere. The only one that Jesus said was with him was his father. So the Holy Spirit that descended upon him and remained upon him, meaning stood there, stayed there, stayed with him, that's the father. That's the only one he said was with him. And that's the only reason why he was not alone. Otherwise, he would have had to say, the Father and the Holy Spirit is with me. And God the Son is with me. He didn't say that, did he? He said the Father, and that's it. So that means your thinking cannot exceed this. Otherwise, your thinking is in error. And again, I speak this in love. If you, if you think something else, you've been taught wrong. If you think three persons is with Jesus, you've been taught wrong. The only one that was with him was the Father. That's the only one he prayed to. That's the only one he heard from. That's the only one he was led by. Now, let's go a little further. Let's go a little further. Watch whose son he is. I'm going to show you his daddy. Look at this. Look at this. Just in case you think the Holy Spirit's not the father and you think that's somebody else. You just saw from Jesus himself. He said the only one that's with him is the father. And that's the reason he's not alone. All right. Matthew 1.18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother, Mary, was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Child of what? Child of the Holy Spirit. I am not alone because the Father is with me. Child of who? child of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's that father. If he's child of the Holy Spirit, he's the son of the Holy Spirit, which makes the Holy Spirit God the father. and makes the son what was born of Mary. The Holy Spirit's not his mother. His mother is mentioned right there, Mary who was betrothed to Joseph. And before the two came together, she was found with the child of the Holy Spirit. How much plainer can that get? So you, you cannot say the Holy Spirit's not his father if he's child of the Holy Spirit. This crushes Trinity doctrine all the way because he can't have two fathers. And you see that it is the same father that Jesus said was in heaven. That's the same father that Jesus said was in him. I can of myself do nothing. It is the father that dwells in me. He does the works. Do you see? But it was the Holy Spirit that was in him. 
when he received the spirit after baptism, he did his first miracle and turned water into wine. But it is the father that dwells in him that does the works. The Holy Spirit's God the Father. Not another spirit. Not another distinct spirit used by God. That's all lies. It is the spirit of God manifesting. So that's a manifestation of the same spirit of the Father. Not somebody else. That's clear. That is clear. Look at this. Watch, watch Jesus in his own words tell you that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the Father himself. Matthew 10, verse 20. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Who is it? Who's the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the spirit of your father who speaks. God cannot call some other spirit the spirit of his of the father. He cannot call some other spirit the spirit of the father. The spirit of the father is the father himself. It is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your father. Who speaks in you. That's clear. All right. Now. Let's look at some more detail. That should have already solved it. Because. I just use scripture to prove the Holy Spirit is the father. That means Trinity is false. In Trinity doctrine. None of, the per none of the three persons can be the same person. Here you see that the Holy Spirit is that Father. Okay. <clears throat> now you can go read these scriptures. This is stuff you can read. This is not stuff I made up. It's not stuff that I inferred. I wasn't taught by man of false doctrine. This is stuff in your Bible. This is what your Bible says. So nothing that anyone else says is going to be above what your Bible says. You see what your Bible says. In the words of Jesus himself, he identified the Holy Spirit as the Father. And he called it the Spirit of the Father. He said that in those words. So how can you deny that and believe what you want to believe? Look at this. Look at this. Uh, <clears throat> let me let me back up here because I want to I want to tie this situation of when the Holy Spirit was brought up as the spirit of the father. I want to tie this in with a couple of other viewpoints of the same situation and see the terms that are used to describe this same spirit. Look at this. Okay, look at let's let's go to verse 18 of Matthew the 10th chapter. And if you don't have a Bible, you can listen. I promise you it's there. All right. You will be brought before governors. Keep this keep this situation in mind. You will be brought before governors and kings for my my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry ab about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak. But the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Now, keep in mind, it's the situation of you being brought before governors, right? And before the rulers, right? Don't worry about what you're going to speak. In that same hour, it will be given to you what you must speak. 
It's not you who speak. It is the spirit of your father. It's the spirit of your father, right? So God the father. Now, let's see something else. Look at Luke. Uh, the 12th chapter of the book of Luke. I want you to keep that situation in mind. Luke chapter 12. And let's look from verse 8. Also, I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him, the son of man, will also confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. What about the Father? How come he didn't mention the Father, y'all? Why would he tell you if you blaspheme against the, the Son of Man, it'll be forgiven. But if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, it, it will not be forgiven. But he doesn't mention the Father. Why? Holy Spirit is the Father. There's no reason to mention the Father as another distinct person. There's only one Spirit of God. That's that Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Now, here's where um, I, I just wanted to show you that, too, to show you that Jesus doesn't mention the Holy Spirit as someone else. Um, look at verse 11. Now, we just we we just read. In Matthew, the 10th chapter about how. Um, when you're brought before the magistrates and the rulers and that's that situation. Don't worry about what you will say. It will be given to you in the very hour. Right. And it said it is the spirit of your father who speaks. Right. It's not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Watch who that spirit is here. And watch that, that the situation is the same. Now, when they bring you, he's saying the same thing. This is just Luke's account. Now, when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. Same thing, right? For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Wait a minute. I thought it was the Father. Matthew 10 and 20 says, the Father. It is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks. He's the one that's going to give to you in the same hour what to say. But in Luke 12 and 12... It says the Holy Spirit is the one who's going to give to you what you ought to say in the very same hour. Same, very same hour, same situation of being brought before the rulers and the magistrates. Same thing. Is it two of them giving you what to say? That would be conflict. Now, this the Holy Spirit is the Father. Now, Look, look, let's look at something else even further. Let's look at something else even further. Look at Luke. Let's stay in Luke. And let's look at chapter 21 of Luke. So you see in one passage, it's the spirit of your father, John 10 and I mean, uh, Matthew 10 and 20. But in Luke 
uh, 12 and 12. It's the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but in Luke 21, let's read from verse 12 to get that this is the same thing. So that you can understand it's not another situation, it's the same situation. And watch who it is here. Luke 21, verse 12. But before all these things, they will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Again, same thing. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle in your heart not to meditate beforehand for what you will answer. Okay? Don't worry about what you will say, right? Look who it is here. Verse 15. For I will give you a mouth of wisdom. <laughs> which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. So here we see it's Jesus. He says, I will give you a mouth of wisdom. Do you see? So in Luke 12 and 12, it's the Holy Spirit that will give you what to say in this situation in the very same hour. In Matthew uh, 10 and 20, it's the, Holy, it's the Spirit of your Father who will give you what to say in the same hour. But in Luke 12 and uh, 15, Jesus says, I will give you a mouth of wisdom. So we see is all one. <laughs> that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the Father. That Jesus is that spirit. Because <laughs> he says, I. So this closes the door for any persons in the Godhead other than the one. <laughs> He's one alone. Jesus as the Spirit is the Father. The Son is just his humanity which he created later. That came after. So that's a complete man who you see the Spirit descend upon. That's the Son. Not the spirit that descended. Doesn't say the spirit that descended was the son. It said who you see the spirit descend upon and remain upon. That's the son. So the flesh was the son. The spirit that descended. That's nobody's son. That's the father. <laughs> All right. Now. Um, if that doesn't already conclude, again, you can go back and read this stuff. I'm not giving you something you can't read. You can go back and see this in your Bible. It crushes the Trinity. There is no Trinity. God is one person. Manifestations are distinct. But he's one alone. <clears throat> um, Ephesians 4 and 4. There is one body and one spirit. How many spirits? One. Just as you were called in one hope of your calling. 
one Lord. How many Lords? Not three Lords. Not three who are Lord. No, one Lord. If there were three spirits who are Lord, then that would make three gods. <laughs> there's only one spirit. And there's only one Lord. All we have is the same Lord manifested in the flesh. <laughs> we don't have another one who's Lord two. Or a third one who's Lord three. Look at this. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. But watch when he gets to God, he adds some detail with it. One God and Father of all. Now he's adding detail in order for you to understand who the one God is. One God and Father of all. Doesn't say one God and three persons. It doesn't say one God in three persons. It doesn't say one God who is three persons. And that doesn't say that. It says one God and Father. Now the thing is, the Father's one person. We don't have three persons who's the Father. That would make three fathers. One God and Father. If the one God's the Father, that's one person. That's singular. Because there's only one person who holds the title God the Father. One God and Father of all. Who is above all. That covers heaven. Who is through all. That covers who's working in us. That's the Holy Spirit. And in you all. That's him. That's in us. So the same one that's above all, up in heaven, the voice that spoke from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's him. Same God that is through all. That's in us, working through us. That's him. Same God that is in us. That's him that is in us. It's the Holy Spirit that is in us. So do you see? So the same God, the Father, and it specifically says the Father. So the Holy Spirit that's in us, that's the Father. Let me read it again. One God and Father of all who is above all. Okay, above all, that's up in heaven. And through all. Wait, that's down here. And in you all. That's down here. But who's down here? Holy Spirit. So, that's him. It's just a different manifestation of him. But it's not somebody else. It's God the Father. So the Holy Spirit that is in you is God the Father that is in you. You see it right here? Now, does he mention anybody else? No, he goes on to talk about a whole nother subject after that. You see? Look at this. So the only God is the Father. He's not a multiplicity of persons. That would, that would limit God. That dumbs God down to say that he needs some partners to help him. No, he does everything by himself. He's God all alone. That's belittling God to say that there's another a person in the Godhead helping him out. That's blasphemy. That's damnable doctrine. That is straight from hell. Look at this. Malachi. Um, 
No, I meant Micah. I want to go to Malachi. Malachi. <clears throat> Two and ten. Have we not all one father? That means there's not three persons who's the father. Have we not all one father? That's how many the father is. One. That's numerically one. Not some other explanation of one. One father. That's clear. Has not one God created us? The one God is the one father. Anything other than that is a false one. That's not what your Bible teaches. It teaches that the one God is the one father. And since only one person can be the father, God is one person. And we see that there, there's a passage of scripture. I don't have it pulled up right now, but, but the father said that he has used similitudes and fashions. So he has shown up in similitudes and in fashions, different manifestations. And he actually says that. But those are not other persons. Those are just similitudes that the father used in order to manifest himself to us in different ways in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, he came in the flesh, in physical form, and that was an ultimate manifestation because the Son of God is the image of the invisible God, that invisible God right here, God the Father. He's not the image of a pre-existent spirit son. Nobody says something about a pre-existent spirit son other than Rome. And Tertullian, who made that lie up. You see? <clears throat> One last thing. Tertullian invented the Trinity. It's not in your Bible. And Matthew 3.17 when you see the three manifestations show up um, all together in one spot, that doesn't mean three persons in the Godhead. That's taking something from the Bible and then trying to fit your doctrine in there when it doesn't say that. You just saw that the Father's, the same Father that's in heaven is the same one that's down here too in operation in both places at the same time. The Son said that he was in him, working through him. He also said that he was in heaven. God is omnipresent, so he can be in more than one place at a time and simultaneously manifest in different ways, even multiple ways, even more than three. And yet it's all one God. Not a multiplicity of persons or groups or buddies working together in the Godhead. Not at at all. All right. All right. Look at this. Look at this. <clears throat> First John. These are the epistles. First John four and thirteen. By this we know that we abide in him. Now, keep in mind, this is the same John, Apostle John, speaking that we found in the Gospel John, speaking. Now, look at his understanding of the Spirit of God and who is in us. Because if anyone would have taught a trinity, he definitely would have been the one to do it. After seeing 
the three manifestations. He would have taught that right off the back, actually, and said, oh, we've got it wrong all this time. It's three of them. And then Trinity would have been popular ever since the baptism of Jesus. But no, one God was still taught throughout the entire Bible. So they didn't understand that to be a trinity. They understood manifestations of the one, the one God. Now, let me, let me just go ahead and read it. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, talking about God. Matter of fact, let me back up to tw verse 12 so that you can see it's talking about God. I don't want to leave no room for wiggle room. Look at this. No one has seen God at any time. That would be the Father, right? If we love one another, God abides in us. Who's that God? The Father. His love has been perfected in us. So the subject is God the Father. It's talking about God, the God that nobody ever seen with the naked eye or looked at from, um, looked at his spirit. Nobody's ever seen his spirit. When Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's talking about seeing the Father in flesh. So seeing him on a lower level as a man, you can see him that way. But to see him in his glory, meaning to look at his spirit and deity, no man can do that and still live. The only one that was able to see him like that is the son, because the son is actually him. In a different manifestation in human identity. So he saw himself. Now, let's look at this. Um, verse 13, by this we know uh, that, that we abide in him, talking about that God, and he in us, that God in us, because he has given us of his spirit. Now, it said he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. So his spirit is not a third person in the Trinity in us. His spirit, it clearly says, that's him in us. Let me read it again. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us. He in us, not somebody else. Not another person in the Godhead in us. He in us. And who's the he that it was talking about? God, the God that nobody ever seen. Who's the God that nobody ever seen? The Father. The Father in us. Because he has given us of his spirit. So notice, of his spirit. Of his spirit. So it's a part of him. Of his spirit. He took of his spirit. When God gave you the Holy Ghost. He took of his own spirit. And put that in you. So that's a part of himself. It's not another person in the Godhead. It is the Godhead. Godhead. <laughs> He's in us because he has given us of his spirit. Just in case you still don't know if it's God the Father. Look at this. Verse 14. And we have seen and testify that the Father. So he's talking about the Father. That the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Does everyone see it? 
So that's clear. That is clear. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him. But wait a minute. He just said that the Holy Spirit, that he has given us of his spirit and he's in us. Who's the he? The he is God the father because now it's mentioned in his son. <laughs> Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God. So that God is the father of that son. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God. God abides in him. Who? The God that's the God, the father of that son. That God abides in us. And he in God. And we know. And believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So he's not talking about some other person in the Godhead. The only God that he's speaking of is the Father. And, that, and that's who abides in us. That's who's in us. Because that Father gave to us of his spirit. Now that's Jesus. Now you say, well, well, I thought the son was Jesus. That's Jesus too. <laughs> Jesus as a man and Jesus as God. Both are him. He originally was always the father. He revealed the name Jesus later for himself. The father had many names. And every time the father would do something, he would give a name for what he did. His redemptive name is Jesus. Because that's the name that means Jehovah saves. So it is Jehovah. But he saved us. By coming in the flesh in human identity to save us. He sacrificed his own body. So the son of God is not a son from scratch. The son of God is God manifest in the flesh. The word was made flesh. The word always was. The word which always was, which was the father or part of the father. He took of himself and manifested of himself in the flesh. Now, if the word was not made flesh, if flesh was just made, then that would be a different story. Then the son would not be him at all. But since he took of his own spirit and the word was made flesh, then something that was eternal was made flesh. <laughs> Do you see? And anything that always was came from God, the Father. So he took of a manifestation of himself, made that into flesh. That's what became flesh or was made flesh. What was eternal, what always was, so part of himself, is what became the son. <laughs> and functioned in human identity as an actual complete man. That's why they speak distinct and he could speak to him and he could speak back to him. That's the distinction. But the, but the person who it is, is the same. It's just that God was made in the likeness of men. So you cannot, <clears throat> you cannot call the man God. But you can call the man Jesus. Let me explain that. If you call the man God, then you mess up the function of the human identity. 
who it is, is Jesus, who is that God the Father. But in human identity, he's not functioning as God at all. He's functioning as man. So a better way to say it would be to say, Jesus is both God and man. And not call the man God, because if you do that, then you screw up the purpose of him coming in the flesh and functioning as a man. And then if you say it's God as a man, but not as God, then that confuses people even more. So it's better to just say Jesus in two identities. Human identity and divine. Flesh and spirit. And by him being by him being the son and coming in the in the in the likeness of flesh, he partook of flesh. That's what you gotta understand. That part. Partook and was made in the likeness um, of a man so much to where he could call them brethren. A piece of the father was made in the likeness so much of mankind that he could call everyone brothers. <laughs> So the father was functioning as a complete human identity as the son. That's why it's a complete distinction. And you cannot, um, you should not call that part of him God because that's a human part of him. Even though it's understandable what you mean by that. You're talking about the person. Yes, but it's the person in a different way. That's the reason why Thomas didn't get in trouble for calling him God. <laughs> my Lord and my God. I mean, he was able to do that and get away with it. And Jesus just accepted it and said, because you have seen me, you believe, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas was Unitarian, Jewish. They don't believe in no other God other than the Father. That's who he identified him to be when he said, my Lord and my God. He's talking about the Father, not God the Son or some other one in the Godhead. No, none of that. The Father, he recognized that's who that is. And he recognized it when he was raised from the dead. <laughs> that's what nailed it for him. Because he raised himself from the dead. <laughs> but the Father was the one that was supposed to do that. But if he did that, then that makes him the Father. <laughs> <laughs> you see it also means that he consists of more than just flesh because if he was just flesh or just man then when the man died then he could not continue as anything else to raise himself from the dead with dead means dead but if he's continuing as something else then that means he consists of something more, which is the spirit. For the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So as the spirit, Jesus always existed. He can go further back than the flesh and say before Abraham was, I was, I am, not I was, I am. And use the actual name of God given to the Jews and speaking right in the Jews' face. Using the name that they know what that means. <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's the difference. Son of God, this son of God is different than how Adam was called son of God. You do know Adam was called son of God too, right? Yeah, Adam was also called 
son of God, but not the, not the same way that Jesus was son of God. Jesus being son of God was God manifest in the flesh. Adam was not God. He's called son of God because God created him. He didn't have no mother. Or biological father. But God created him from scratch. So he's called son of God because he's son of God's creation. No mother. <clears throat> but Jesus, on the other hand, the word was made flesh. God used something eternal from himself in order to make that flesh. <laughs> You see, he used what wasn't created to make that flesh. And that's what became the flesh. The word. So that's him in human identity. But then what the human identity was indwelt with was another part of him that was not made flesh. That would be the spirit that came upon him. That's the part of him that was not made flesh. So we have two manifestations. We have one manifestation, the word made flesh, and then we have another manifestation, the Holy Ghost indwelling the flesh. <laughs> so by the Holy Ghost indwelling the flesh, then this puts the Father's deity in the flesh. <laughs> Not the flesh, but in it. While the other part of the Father, another manifestation, became that actual flesh and was made lower than the angels for the purpose of being able to taste death. By the way, Jesus never died. He gave up the ghost. Did you notice that? He went through a crucifixion and didn't die. He gave up the ghost. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Then he breathed his last. He exited the body. On his own. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down. <laughs> I have power to lay it down. I also have power to take it up again. I am the resurrection. But the father raised Jesus from the dead. I am the resurrection. <laughs> He's the father. Manifested. In human identity. Not just God dwelling in a body. You say that then you're going to get confused. No, God partaken in humanity. That's different. <laughs> That means he became like he was somebody else in the likeness of a whole nother person. That son is, is him. And in, he lives forever in order to make intercession for us. So that's why God didn't have a problem with giving all of his tools over to the son. Giving him all power and all authority over heaven and over earth and turning the judgment over to him. And God doesn't have an issue doing it because it's himself in human identity. <laughs> Otherwise, he would have did that for Moses or one of the prophets of the Old Testament and said, here, you take it. You be God, too. But no, but but. With the son, it's a different story because that son is his own human identity. He laid down his own life for us. Um, real quickly, let me. I wasn't planning this, but I'll I'll just share it. John, First John, three, sixteen. Because this. We know love because he laid down his life for us. <clears throat> we also ought to lay down our life.
life for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does he, the love of God abide in him? You see, so it's talking about the love of God. It's talking about God. And it says God laid down his life for us. Which means the son of God is God's own humanity. Is his life. There's two lives that was dwelling in Jesus. One was eternal. And the other was given. One life was based on blood. Which was made and created. The other life always existed. Which was spiritual life. Eternal life always was no beginning. You see, the life eternal from the spirit created the life that was by blood. His pre existence stage created his non pre existence stage. <laughs> he created his own body and his body was living by blood while his spirit was living by eternity <laughs> so you have human life and eternal life all in one person And the person's name who has both lives is Jesus. So God in the flesh can lay down his life. Because that flesh is his life. <laughs> That's why it says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But we understand the love of God because he laid down his life <laughs> for us. See how that makes sense? That he came in the flesh. That human identity was him in another way. So by laying it down and putting it on the cross, he's really putting himself up there in a different identity. And that's how it's love. Now, if it was somebody else, that's not him. That's not love. No, the love would be coming from the person, the other person that did that for us. But, but if it's him in human identity, then it's different. Then, then we can say this is the love of God because it was actually... God taking that beating in the flesh. <laughs> now, of course, I'm not saying that they crucified God in spirit. But God manifested in the flesh, taking on flesh and sharing in human identity. He could experience crucifixion and death. And he created that manifestation for that purpose. Not only that purpose, but also for the purpose of being able to be a perfect mediator for us. So that he himself can function in human identity. One passage of scripture, I think it's Galatians 3 and 20. It says that um, a mediator does not mediate for one. Meaning that there needs to be two involved in order for mediation. But it says God is one. Now there's no reason to make the distinction unless God is the same God who is mediating. is the same God that <laughs> he's mediating too. But as the mediator, he's not God. He's not functioning as God. He's a man there. But... Um, 
in spirit form, he's that God that he's mediating to. So this allows him to have control over both the mediation and who he's mediating to. That's why it says a mediator does not mediate of one, meaning that there's got to be two persons involved for mediation. But then he says God is one. So he can do it because he was manifested in the flesh and he's able to operate as both. <laughs> because his manifestation in the flesh is not just him in a different way. It's a whole different identity than his identity as a spirit only. So that's why he can function as the father and the son. And it's complete distinction between the two. But yet the two are him alone. <laughs> so there you have it, y'all. Um, I know that was a lot, but it's good for you. Bible's good for you. Peace.